Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Paul Martin. I'm a Master of City Planning in 2001 with Course 11. And it's my pleasure to say hello to all of you and welcome you on behalf of first generation alumni of MIT. You might be wondering about us. We are an MIT affinity group with about 360 alumni members. We officially launched in November 2020 as a way to create a community for MIT alumni who are first in their families to graduate from college and to support others, one another, going through the, our lifelong journey of being first. And importantly, also to advocate for first-gen low-income students at MIT, known by the acronym FLI, they like to be called FLI students. As the first in our families to attend colleges, our experiences are distinct from other MIT students. Core to our mission is to support FLY students with mentorship and create spaces for first-gen low-income students to bring their full selves, share their lived experiences, and receive alumni support in meeting academic, professional, and social challenges. We partner with the Office of the First Year, MIT Admissions, and the MIT Alumni Association to create opportunities like the one you're participating in tonight. If you're in the first in your family to attend college and have not yet joined our community, we'd love to have you. Please log on to the MIT Infant Connection, go to your profile, navigate your way to communities. If you click on the button to self-identify, you'll receive invites to our upcoming events. And importantly, for those of you interested in connecting with first-gen low-income students, this is the first step to getting there. Now, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to give you a quick some quick ground rules. The chat is disabled, so we can fully focus on the presenter, Selena, and, and the takeaways she'll give us tonight. We encourage you to send your questions via Q&A using the button at the bottom of the screen. Also, we have disabled the anonymous question feature because we really want you to own the questions and make sure that you're credited for them. All questions will show up on the Q&A screen. So we have a great feature where you can upvote a question or add a comment to a question already in place if you have the same or a similar question. And we'll certainly try to get to as many as we can that time it might allow. Now this session is being live captioned and please be patient with the live captioner. We know how many acronyms we have at MIT and sometimes there's a struggle there. But here we go and importantly, I want to welcome you to the webinar titled, How Service Led Me to an Unexpected Career Path to What I Love. Our presenter is our very own career and executive coach, Selena Lee, who graduated from MIT in course 15 in 2001. Interestingly, the same year I did, although we were on different sides of the infinite quarter, and we didn't get to know each other. However, I got to know Selena through her deep and selfless involvement to support first-gen low-income students through our affinity group. After MIT, Selena was an investment banker and a corporate attorney. She's the creator and host of Live Your Dream podcast and founder of Give One Dream. But let me let her tell you all about it. So let's please welcome Selena Lee. Selena, please take it away. Thank you, Paul, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm so happy to meet you all. Thank you all for being here. I don't know wherever you are joining from the world. It's about 7 p.m. in New York City. And the beauty about um, a webinar like this is that, you know, a lot of the MIT alumni and um, students can join from all over the world. So thank you for being here. Um, before I start, let me share my screen so I can make sure to do that. Okay. Can you all see my uh, screen okay? Yeah? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Selena Lee, and um, today I'm here to talk about how service led me to unexpected career path to do what I love. Um, as Paul introduced, I am a Korean executive coach, and my mission in, li in life is to help people pursue their dreams and, and to transition into careers that they find to be fulfilling and meaningful. Um, before I get started, I wanted to share a little bit about my journey and how I got to where I am and how service led me to this kind of unexpected career path that I had not envisioned or planned when I was graduating from MIT. So um, like you, I've had my own fair shares of struggles and, <laughs> and transitions um, in my own career path. Um, I think when I was, uh, you know, growing up, 
I got this message that um, as long as I work hard to go to a good school and, you know, and get a good job, somehow I'm going to end up being happy and successful. And many of you who attended MIT probably can resonate with that story, right? So after um, graduating from MIT, I started my career as an investment banker at Merrill Lynch, and then I went to law school and became a corporate attorney and practiced at a big law firm in New York City. And um, I thought that's ultimately what I had wanted in my life, you know, uh, go to law school, get a job as a corporate attorney, work for a big law firm in the city. And ironically enough, when I actually got there, I felt like it's not what I wanted. <laughs> and I felt like I worked so hard to win the race and I won the race, but it was not the race that I wanted. So how come nobody told me that I should have thought about what you know, what if I even wanted to be in that race. Um, so it's ironic that that's when I start to really think about what it is that I wanted out of my life. And um, how funny that, you know, I was asking myself that question for the very first time after I was done getting all the degrees and jobs, right? I looked at my uh, partners at the law firm who I'm actually still good friends with some of them. And they've been you know, reviewing private equity contracts for many, many years, 20, 30 years. And I just saw them, I'm like, I don't, I don't wanna be doing the same thing and for 20, 30 years. And for me, um, there wasn't a lot of meaning in helping really rich people become richer because that's what you did as a private equity attorney, right? So that's the first time when I actually thought about, okay, well, what do I want to do next? And, and I, uh, you know, there was really no blueprint for how to really figure out what you want to do. And it's not something that we learned at MIT and I wish we had learned that, right? So that's the first time I gave myself the permission to really do the things that brings me joy and that I found to be fulfilling and meaningful, even though it had nothing to do with my job as a lawyer at the time. And this is when I had remembered that my very first childhood dream was to one day have a book with my own name on it. I was, you know, I loved to read books when I was growing up. And I thought, you know, when I, you know, become an adult, how wonderful would it be if I could have my own book with my own name on it? And that was my very first childhood dream. And when I was kind of, you know, lost in my career and kind of trying to figure out my next step, that's what I had remembered. I didn't necessarily, uh, I still don't have the plans to become like a full-time writer or anything, but I just wanted one book with my name on it. I thought my future self would be proud of it. Like, you know, when I'm like an 80 year old grandma, you know, looking back at my childhood years, you know, wouldn't it be fun if I could look back at my younger years and know that I had the courage to do something that I wanted to do and the courage to pursue my dreams. So I decided to write my book. Um, I also decided to write my book in Korean because I uh, grew up being bilingual and bicultural and also um, in that experience, although as challenging as it was, um, navigating you know, different cultural barriers and language barriers, it profoundly shaped me into who I am today. And what I thought was a disadvantage actually turned out to be a huge advantage. So I wanted to kind of utilize that um, skill sets of being bilingual to bring um, Korean American successful stories to the audience, to the readers in Korea. So I just decided to interview um, successful Korean Americans who achieved success in different industries and then interview them in English, but write the book in Korean and get it published in Korea. So <laughs> I only graduated from elementary school in Korea. So uh, my mom thought I was crazy that I wanted to publish a book in Korea and Korean. And she said like, who do you think you are? Like, no one's going to read your book, no one's going to publish your book. So, you know, she was very, very discouraging, but I thought, you know, maybe, maybe what if it does work out? What if I can make it happen? How wonderful would that be? So it's a, that's a long story, but it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but one of the most meaningful experiences. So uh, my book did get published. It's called Kumul I guess uh, the English translation of the title may be something like Leave Your Dream. And I interviewed nine dif different people in nine different industries. And the what I wanted to share was there wasn't one path to success. And so I wanted to bring stories of people from diverse industries and like 
how did they figure out what they want to do with their life? And how did they know that's what they wanted? And um, how did they overcome failures and rejections to really achieve their dreams? And uh, my book did get published to my mom's big surprise <laughs> by actually a really great publisher. And um, there's something very unique about my book, which is that um, the last chapter, the 10th chapter is dedicated to the readers to write their own dreams in it. So they can become part of the book. Um, and I, I dedicated the 10th chapter for the readers because um, hopefully by the time they've read nine stories, they're feeling inspired and thinking about what they want to do. And it was an invitation and a place and a, a space for them to, you know, write down what they might want to do with their life and actually write it down. Um, I've always had a habit of writing down my goals and dreams and my family, my, my mom still has my dream list from like seventh grade. And I was surprised that, you know, I have uh, achieved all of it. So there was a lot of power and magic in writing down your goals and dreams. So this was uh, a way for people to, you know, have, uh, have an opportunity to do that. And I thought people are just going to you know, do it on their own. But to my big surprise, a lot of people started to send me their dreams. So they started um, sharing social media. Um, some people, um, you know, email me their dreams. Some readers flew from Korea to New York. Uh, when they were visiting New York, they came to visit and they um, wrote down their 10th dream chapter and gave it to me as a gift. <laughs> and I felt was I was really inspired and moved by reading all these dreams. But what I had realized was that um, even though people had all these amazing dreams, they didn't have the courage to pursue them and they were making excuses like maybe someday and maybe one day but you know I don't have time or I don't have the right skills or talents whatever so it really broke my heart to know that um, there's so many people who wanted to achieve these dreams and but weren't making time for them and I had read somewhere that um, one of the biggest regret people have before they they die is that they didn't have the courage to honor their dreams. And this is one of the biggest regret before they die. So I thought, why don't I create a community of people that really encourage and support and inspire one another to achieve our dreams together? And that's how Give One Dream was born. And um, I've done a lot of campaigns and initiatives and, and events for Give One Dream. And um, one of the campaign was called Share Your Dream Campaign, where I asked people to write their dreams on a postcard and um, or draw their dreams on a postcard and then give it to me. And then I would share them on social media. It was just a very simple idea, kind of like a condensed version of the 10th uh, chapter of my book. <laughs> um, and it was just a safe place for people to, you know, cause like when's the last time someone asked you about your dream, right? And when I asked them to write it down they actually had an opportunity to kind of think about it for the first time. So that's that's what I did. And um, to my surprise, I started to get dreams from so many different places and so many different communities and actually eventually a lot of dreams from different parts of the world. So people um, were writing down their bucket list. People were drawing something that they want to do and experience and so on. Um, one of the goal for the campaign was to give voice to people who usually don't have a chance to be heard. So I went to um, speak at a lot of the middle school and high school um, in communities that were high poverty, um, some of the most challenging neighborhoods in our community. So um, some of the school, um, some of the neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Bronx where um, they have the highest crime rates and also in Korea. And, um, I've learned that some of these kids um, have never been asked what their dreams are because a lot of them are, um, their parents are incarcerated or many, actually majority of them are um, children of immigrant families. So, you know, it's, it's just really <laughs> tough to make, you know, get by. So the parents didn't necessarily have the time to really be there for their children in the way that their children needed them. So I think, the children were really surprised when I showed up and asked them, you know, to tell me about their dreams and they would write it down or draw and I would share them on social media. It like really made their day. And their, you know, students, uh, their teachers were telling me how um, after I went to go visit, like they are all of a sudden coming to school and working harder in school. I think it made them feel like someone cared about them. And 
um, I think it is our human's fundamental desire to be heard and to understood. And when I asked them about, you know, your dreams is important and, you know, never let anyone tell you that you can't do something. I think they felt like, well, someone actually cares about me and my, and my dream and I'm going to, I'm going to do something with my life. So, and the words kind of started to spread and I started to hear from different communities and, 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 um, and one of the things that happened was um, I heard from this school in Ghana and Africa and they um, wrote to me and said, Selena, I heard about your um, campaign and we would love our, uh, our children at our school would love to participate, but we don't have any crayons. I saw that the dreams that you post are really colorful, but is it okay if we draw our dreams in, in, in pencil? And it really broke my heart to know that there are kids in this world who grew up without crayons. So I I, I raised some money within the community and then we sent them lots and lots of crayons. And then I got back some of the most beautiful <laughs> dreams that I've ever seen. And um, I haven't met them yet, but apparently they're asking me like, when is a dream lady coming to visit us? <laughs> so hopefully when COVID is over um, and when it's safer, I can go visit them. And the day that I got back their dreams, I, you know, I got really teary eyed and I think it was probably the most meaningful um, moments of my life because here was, you know, one person in New York City with the dream and an idea, you know, it doesn't take a lot of money or <laughs> to be able to take action towards this idea. And, and, and because I did, I feel like I made a somewhat of a difference on their lives. You know, these kids got to express their dreams in color for the first time in their lives. And I think I was happier than when I got into MIT because it was such a meaningful uh, moment for me. And look at, you know, look, look at him. He's like so talented in drawing, right? Um, so I got back lots and lots of um, dreams and the, I started to expand the campaign to other communities. And this is kind of a sad picture. It's a, a picture from a shelter in Cambodia where they protect and educate and, uh, and, um, and, and take care of young girls who were sexually abused at a young age. And uh, we sent them crayons and they were able to also express their dreams in color. And um, I thought about how, you know, if it even makes a difference just to show up one day and ask these kids about their dreams and then have them write it down or draw it and then to share if that's gonna make a difference, how wonderful would it be if I can actually create a curriculum and teach them for a semester? So I volunteered to teach at a um, high poverty neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York um, at a high school. And I taught juniors and seniors. And um, in the beginning, you know, they everybody started out with a writing down their dreams on a postcard. And then eventually by the end of the semester, um, they would have made a meaningful progress towards achieving it or some had actually had achieved it. So um, his dream was to be a singer songwriter. So he, um, you know, shared a song that he composed and um, his dream was to be an artist. So he um, shared lots of artworks that he created uh, during our program together. And his dream was to be a DJ. So he pretended to be a DJ and then <laughs> performed a song for us. Um, and his dream was to be a basketball player. So he talked about how every day he worked hard to improve his game. There's a one student that I, you know, to this day, I remember his name is um, Jared and he was a junior um, at the high school. And uh, there was one, you know, one time I, I went and what I talked about was um, if there's something that you really want to achieve, you have a dream, think about what is one action you can take towards your dream, just one small action and actually take action that day. And so that's what I talked about. The next day I was, um, back on campus to um, teach the seniors class. And Jared is usually a really shy guy and he doesn't really speak up much. He's very tall and, <laughs> um, you know, but soft-spoken. And he saw me on the hallway and he was like, Selena, you know, I have something to tell you. And I was like, yeah. And then he said, you know, I, what he said, you know, what you share with me really, um, uh, I really like what you shared yesterday. So I thought about what it is that I can do for my dream and what action I can take. And his dream was to be a fashion model. And he thought he then, um, you know, Googled all the fashion models that he admires and 
thought about like how they, you know, got to achieve their dreams. And they realized like all of them um, belong to this like modeling agency and how, you know, to do that, you need to get your portfolio or take your photographs and then, and then send it in. And he realized all of them started when they're 17 and he's 16. So he thinks he's a chance. So now he's going to you know, take his pictures and send it in. And he said, Selena, when I um, walk on the New York fashion runway, I will invite you. And that really made my day. Um, I also did a lot of different events for Give on Dreams. So um, kind of like a live version of my book where I would invite inspiring speakers and to, you know, share about their um, journey of how they achieve their dreams. Um, I did um, events where I um, invited people about, you know, how they transition their careers. Um, I also did parties where I asked people to um, dress up as their future selves as if their dreams came true. So kind of like Halloween for dreams. And people had a lot of fun. This is an event that we did um, in Korea. And her dream was to be on the cover of the Forbes magazine. So she cut up a picture and then, you know, pretend that she was on the cover. So people are really, really creative. Um, one of the big mission for a Give on Dream community is pay for it. And, you know, we all know that, you know, um, we are all here because somebody helped us to get to where we are, right? It could be um, an eighth grade English teacher who encouraged you when nobody, uh, you know, believed in you, or it could be uh, maybe a professor at MIT, it could be a family member, it could be a friend, right? But there's someone who helped us to get to where we are now. We may not be able to pay them back directly for their kindness, but we can always pay for it and help somebody else. When I was um, uh, starting to put together events for Give on Dream, um, I thought that we should have some food and drinks for the events. Um, obviously, this is before COVID when we could have in-person events. And one thing, um, you know, I thought, well, we need, we should have food and drinks because, and it helps people to bond and, you know, uh, build relationships. So we need to charge a small amount of fee for people to attend. But then I thought, there may be some people who really want to come, but they can't afford it. And they and the people who can't afford it may need this event and may need to hear the message the most. So I thought about um, how, you know, I'm going to make sure that money never prevents people from coming to Gibbon Dream events. So someone has to pay for that, right? So I thought about, okay, how can I make this happen? So I, um, I came up with this idea um, called the pay for ticket where whether you come or even if you can't make it, you can sponsor a ticket for somebody else. And when I decided that I'm going to implement this idea, like so many people said, like, you know, no one's going to pay for a ticket for someone that they don't even know, like it's not going to work, but I believe people would. <laughs> and, you know, when I did my first event, like we sold way more pay for tickets than the real regular tickets. And the total number of pay for tickets that we sold um, really exceeded anybody's expectation. I remember before um, one of our events in New York City, um, I got an email from a man in uh, Brisbane, Australia, a place I have not been yet. And he said, Selena, I don't know how he heard about our, our event, but he said, Selena, I heard about Give on Dream and, and I love the idea. And he said, you know, I would love to come to New York to attend your event in person to be surrounded by so many inspiring people, but I don't have the money to go to New York and I'll probably never have the money to go to New York. But here I'm going to um, sponsor two pay for tickets so you can give it to someone with an amazing soul. And he said, I hope that one day you'll come to Brisbane, Australia to have an event here um, so I can attend in person because um, he thinks that Give One Dream in his words was um, refreshing, inspiring, and heartfelt. And I really got, you know, a little teary eyed when I, when I um, got that message. And I thought, how amazing is it that, you know, one idea really can make a difference. And hopefully one day I'll be able to have these inspiring events in, you know, many different parts of the world. So I, um, you know, as I was looking, reflecting back on my career path and my life, um, I thought about how 
my resume was so like, <laughs> not, uh, you know, was not disorganized, but it was like, I've done so many random event, random things, right, that seemed to not be related to each other. And there was a moment when I kind of like beat myself up for like, how come like, I can't just stick to finance or law or like everybody else does? How come I have so many different interests? Um, so as I was kind of reflecting back on my life and my career path, I thought about, um, you know, even though they seemed unrelated to each other, of all the things that I've done, the ones that brought me the most joy all had common themes. I've learned that I'm the happiest when I can help people. And of all the things that brought me joy, the common themes were people and stories. So I realized I, I just have to do that. You know, I know that, you know, what I'm, what, what I need to do. So um, I started a podcast several years ago called Live Your Dream with Selena Lee. Now, um, in, and, you know, I'm able to share stories to a lot of people in different parts of the world. Um, if you want to check out one episode, I highly recommend this episode called How to Make Yourself Happy. Um, it's an interview with Michael Kim, who's a lawyer. We don't really talk about law that he talks about how to make yourself happy. People have re-listened to this episode many, many times, like reading a good book again and again. So if you want to check out one episode, I can, by the way, all the uh, links and the resources that I'm talking about, I'll be sure to um, share them with you. Um, and then, so you don't have to take notes and you'll get it um, after the talk. So I'll be sure to send them all. So um, I went on and on about talking about dreams. Why? Because I hope that you'll have a time to think about your dreams. Um, normally, you know, when I do my regular career workshops, it's much longer and we have time to actually have you write it down and share. We unfortunately don't have time to do that. But I hope that what I've shared with you today at least have made you think about what is that you really want to do. It doesn't have to be a job. It doesn't have to really be related to your career necessarily. It may be, but if you can do anything without the fear of failure, what would you do? And I think my, um, you know, when I was thinking about my dream, um, I always thought about how back when I was a corporate lawyer, <laughs> where I felt like what I did wasn't very meaningful for me, um, I thought about how wonderful would it be if I can do what I love and believed to be meaningful anywhere in the world. And at the time, um, it just seemed like a seemingly impossible dream, but I kept thinking about um, how I may be able to make it happen. And then I started with this very simple thing by giving myself the permission to do the things that brings me joy and find to be meaningful, even if it has nothing to do with my job as a lawyer at the time. I think one of the mistakes that I made when I was a student at MIT or when I was younger is that even though I was interested in some things, I would always um, be like, oh, but I want to do X, Y, and Z, but, you know, it sounds interesting, but, oh, is that going to help me get into better school or is that going to help me get a better job? And if I felt like it probably wouldn't help, I wouldn't let myself do it. I'd only do things that look good on resume or application. And I think that's why I really limited myself and my experiences. And because, and that led to me not knowing what I wanted to do, because if you want to know what you want to do with your life, you just got to try a lot of different things, right? So, you know, after I wrote the book and started the community and then I became a speaker and um, I started a podcast, I just felt like, you know, I got to do something where I help people and where I, um, you know, like tell their stories or help people, you know, uh, listen to their stories. There's got to be some thing I do with people and stories. So um, through, um, kind of like a random seemingly events started to happen. And um, I got invited to participate in like a fellowship leadership program in New York City. And um, one of the perks for joining the program was I got coaching. And that's the first time I actually experienced coaching. And that really changed my life. You know, for the first time in my life, someone who was not a family member or friend who had no agenda other than wanting me to become the best that, that I can be, you know, asked me really good questions and helped me to learn about myself. And then to really be honest about what I want versus what I think I should want, right? And that completely changed the trajectory of my life. And I kind of envied my coach. And I was like, you know, I wish I could do what she does, but, but my identity as a lawyer was so strong. So I kept 
you know, preventing myself from doing that. You know, I was like, no, no, I'm a lawyer. I've invested so much, you know, so many, so much, so many, you know, so much time and money. And like, I've been a lawyer, like that's all my friends are lawyers. You know, my identity was a lawyer. So how could I give this all up? And my sister, I have an older sister and um, she was like, She's like, didn't you write a whole book about pursuing dreams? Like, why don't you follow your own dream? <laughs> why don't you follow your own advice? I was like, oh, you're right. <laughs> so I gave myself the permission to enroll in the coaching school that my coach went to. And even then I was telling myself, no, no, I'm not quitting becoming a lawyer. I'm just going to, you know, um, you know, learn about coaching and maybe this will help me create some programs for give on dream. That's how I convinced myself. But then the first day of the class, uh, even though like I, you know, these are all new people that I'm meeting, I felt like I came home. It was like the weirdest experience, like the I felt like I was wearing really comfortable clothes that fit me so well, and I can just be me and do this really well. Never really thought that way in all my other jobs. And so that's when I knew that, it, like, finally, everything that I've done made sense and that I knew that this was my calling. And um, then, you know, even the struggles through career transitions and not knowing and really feeling like, I didn't, I worked so hard yet, I didn't even know what I wanted. So, you know, what really went wrong, right? Um, and I, it just made sense because if I went, didn't go through those struggles myself, I would not be able to relate to people who are going through those, those experiences. So, you know, that's, um, it finally made sense, like why I had to go through all of that. Um, the identity transition from a lawyer to coach was not an easy one, though. You know, a lot of people ask me that and they're like, how did you do that? How did you, you know, um, just quit? Well, it was a gradual transition and um, probably a biggest one, uh, biggest one that people fear. Right. Especially in like immigrant families and Asian American communities and especially older Asian <laughs> people they're like what is coaching why would you not want to be a lawyer anymore that is so much better are you crazy you're gonna throw away all of your credentials and do what you know so a lot of people were um, um, concerned but I've learned that um, you know I've listened to the societal definition of success for years and years and it did not work for me so I decided that I'm no longer going to let other people's um, you know, definition of success really define my path. So sometimes happiness is where, you know, uh, is possible when you have the courage to create and your own path and do it your way and not necessarily listen to what other people think you should do. It's a very scary thing. You know, I remember, um, uh, when I was going to like receptions or networking events, I'm sure, you know, before COVID, we have a lot of those in New York city. Right. And, um, uh, people are like ask you like oh what's your name and what do you do and when you say I'm Selena and I work at Ropes and Gray in New York and like no more questions asked and you know I'm a lawyer like uh, you know everybody knows what that is so but all of a sudden I remember when I was no longer you know um, part of some big institution that could like protect you and make you feel safe and I think same thing goes with MIT right like that credential kind of protects you but also shields you right um, it's like a safety net but I think when I was no longer part of that big organization and when I no longer wanted to be a lawyer, like I saw myself hesitate for a little bit, like, oh, I'm Selena. And, you know, uh, and, and then I saw how, uh, and then that was a big shock for me. I was like, wow, am I a person who only feels good about myself when I do something that other people think is good, right? That was a scary moment for me because no job or no anything in life will last forever, right? Um, so, um, you know, how, how could I be, just be um, proud of who I am as a person rather than only be proud of myself when I, um, you know, do something that other people think is good, right? So that's when I learned and realized that that is not how I wanted to live my life. So it's one, um, I remember the day that I decided that I'm going to call myself a coach. I would like practice at home, like, hi, my name is Selena. I'm a coach and I, you know, help people transition to their fulfilling careers. I would practice. Now it's so natural. I've done it so many times. And this literally is, you know, my, my dream life. And I can't believe this is my job. But at the time there was a lot of um, a trend, like huge identity shift that has to happen. And 
Um, and I went through it and I cannot believe I do what I do every day and I get paid to do it And because this is literally my dream come true because I'm like, even if I won the lottery, I would still be doing what I do. And um, um, last year during the pandemic, I was actually in Korea for a long time and I was thinking about how, um, you know, I, even though I was in Korea, not even New York City, I was able to grow my coaching business and help people and, you know, do a lot of speaking and do the podcast all from all remotely. Right. And I thought, wow, my dream, I, I achieved my dream. My dream was to always do what I love and find to be meaningful anywhere in the world. And somehow without knowing I had achieved it. <laughs> so I just wanted to share a little bit of but my story um, and how, you know, service led me to do what I do now. And it was an unexpected career path. If you rewind and go back to the beginning of my story, right? I didn't start out writing the book thinking that I would become this like full-time writer or, you know, have this vision of how this was going to change the trajectory of my life. Not at all. I just gave myself the permission to write the book because it was my childhood dream. And then I wanted to help people. So I created the community. And then, you know, there was one thing led to another. And um, so if I could give you one advice is that, you know, give yourself the permission to do something that you find to be meaningful and that brings you joy, even if it has nothing to do with your job and just take small action every day. And then you may one day be surprised to find that you are already living your dream. <laughs> so I think now coaching for many, many years, and I really believe this is my calling. And I've learned a lot about why people um, are stuck and why some people find what they love and why some people don't and why some people succeed, why some people don't. And um, I came up with the coaching framework that I teach to all my clients. So um, I would love to you know, share you with an overview. Um, usually I do a uh, career workshop with, where it's like hour and a half, two hours. So we definitely don't have the time to um, go into all the details, um, but hopefully um, you know, we, I can uh, uh, partner with MIT alumni uh, office and maybe do another career workshop. So obviously you're invited to that if you want to come. But today will be just a brief overview and um, I will be sure to send you all the links where you could do some of the exercise that I will mention on your own. So at least you get the benefit of, you know, what I've created for you. So in order to do what you love, all you need is love. <laughs> love is a actually an acronym um, for my coaching framework. So um, L stands for learn about yourself. O um, stands for overcome internal obstacles. V is visualize your success and E is explore and take action. And I'll talk briefly about each of the steps. Um, L is learn about yourself. So how do we do that? You know, like people say, I don't know what I want, <laughs> right? It's because we haven't taken the time to really learn about ourselves. And how do we learn about ourselves? It is through our emotions. I have my clients every day journal. Um, an answer to this question. How did you feel today? And what did you learn about what's important to you through that emotion? It could be a negative emotion. It could be a positive emotion. Our emotion is just a data. It's just information. It's just telling you that if you feel happy today, you know, there's a match between what you want and what you have. And if it was a negative feeling, then there's a mismatch. It's just saying close the gap, right? And mm -hmm. our emotions tell us about our values. Um, our values are what makes our life fulfilling and meaningful and what makes us thrive in our lives. And um, I do have to make a distinction that values are not morals or ethics. It's not what you should do, uh, should do but it's what you like to do. Um, living your values doesn't mean doing the right thing. It means doing the things that makes you feel right. So um, when you're very clear about your values um, and that this comes from being honest with yourself and what you want versus what you think you should want. <laughs> There's a, it's a, this is a big reason why so many people are not happy because they don't really choose what is that they want, but they choose based on what other people want for them. So um, I have my clients do these um, value exercises, which we don't have time to do, but I put them all in the um, selenali.co forward slash MIT, where you can find the link to the value assessments. And I've also linked my podcast episode that explains it. So you're welcome to try that on your own. Oh, ooh, sorry about that. I don't know why did I, okay, let me just open. Okay, my, I'm back on, right? Okay, perfect. Um, so one of the um, question that you might be, you might wanna ask is like, are you holding on to values that are no longer your value and not serving you? 
because our values um, are product of our experiences and it can come from um, our family or our um, community around us. Um, it could come from our parents and uh, you know friends. So some of the values that used to serve you, what you thought were your values, uh, may no longer be your values. I mean, we're MIT graduates, so maybe this analogy might, might make sense. You know, um, if you have like an iPhone, you sometimes need to do operating, uh, you have to do update on your iPhone, right? If you don't do it, like some things kind of don't match. Values are like that. You got to like do your update on your values. Um, otherwise, um, it might explain why you might not be feeling satisfied or totally fulfilled. Because um, when you're living your values, like that's when you feel really, really happy. So you have to think about, I think X, Y, Z is important. Maybe it could be prestige or making a lot of money or, um, you know, working a lot of hours in some seemingly prestigious job, but maybe every day you're not happy there. Um, what is the value that you're holding on to? Maybe it's the reputation, prestige, or the name of the firm um, that seems impressive to other people. But is that really important to you, right? I mean, I guess I'm, you know, describing what I went through, right? Um, so if you're not happy or satisfied in your career or life, the question to ask yourself is, are my core values being violated, right? Um, we obviously have, you know, no job is perfect or no career, not, no relationship, no, nothing is ever perfect, right? So, um, but, and so there are some, you know, things that we do have to tolerate, right? But, um, when your core values are being violated, that's when you're going to be really upset. So um, this is a question to ask yourself whether you have to make a big change in your life. Um, second step to love framework is um, overcome internal obstacles. And this is our fear uh, or fear of failures, of fears of rejections and um, the inner negative voice that we all have, right? So we need to be able to reframe um, our inner negative voice and reframe our fear, um, reframe uh, what it means to be, um, what it means to have be to have failures and rejections. So um, we all have inner negative voice, right? Like that voice that says like, you're not good enough and who do you think you are? You'll never be able to do that. And um, it's really remarkable how many mean things that we say to ourselves <laughs> that we would never say to other people, right? So one helpful technique to manage that is to literally name it. Like name it like you would name like a cat or a dog like or another pet, right? And treat it as a separate character. Um, uh, mine is Shrek. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's Shrek, just like funny looking character. So um, I just named it Shrek. I also have a, a, a another name when my inner negative voice comes to me in Korean because <laughs> I'm bilingual, right? So when you name an inner negative voice, you you give it less power. You know it is part of you, but it's not all of you. And how much power you give to it is entirely up to you. Um, Ariana Huffington, who's the founder of the Huffington Post magazine, who's an amazingly successful woman, she calls her in a negative voice, the obnoxious roommate. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you have to coexist with this roommate and she's going to sometimes come out of the room and say really rude and mean things, but you have to learn to, you know, live with her. So um, I think it might be fun for exercise for you to kind of name your inner negative voice and then to become aware of it whenever it comes like you feel like oh my god like I that was you know so terrible or I can't do something what if I fail you know that's your inner negative voice speaking so just by you know naming it and labeling it and knowing that it is part of you but not all of you you can choose to not give it so much power and you can just talk to it oh I see Shrek you're here but I don't have time to talk to you so why don't you go take a hike and and it's going to come back but you know the more you do that the um, over time you're going to be able to be become aware of it much more, uh, much more frequently. Another thing is that we struggle with is the fear of rejections, right? So, um, you know, like people are so afraid of failing or getting rejected. And it makes sense why, you know, it doesn't really feel good to be rejected, of course, right? Um, but I actually learned um, to get rejected well, <laughs> meaning I don't, uh, you know, it doesn't really affect me really anymore. When I was writing my book, I learned that because as I've shared with you, it was an interview book, right? So um, I was trying to reach out to all these people who I wanted to interview and nobody was getting back to me, you know, either they said no, or wouldn't even respond. And it really kind of 
hurt my feelings in the beginning. But then I thought about why am I getting rejected here? Well, it's because I'm trying to achieve my dream of writing a book, right? And if I wasn't doing that, there would be no reason for me to be reaching out to these people and no reason for me to be rejected. So if you actually think about it, the fact that I'm getting rejected is the evidence, it's the proof that I'm taking action to get one step closer to your goals and dreams, right? If you're not doing anything, there's no reason to be rejected, right? So then uh, when I was able to reframe rejection as the evidence that I'm taking action to get one step closer to my goals and dreams, um, it, be it became very freeing and very liberating. And I've been doing these rejection challenges um, um, now where I actually challenge myself to get as many rejections as possible. And I actually kind of think about it. Like when's the last time I got rejected? And like, if I haven't in like the last month, I know that something needs to change because I know I'm playing it safe. And this is actually a homework that I also give to all my clients. So we, we you know, think about how we can celebrate rejections. And this is a beautiful thing because um, not many people have figured out a lot of people self-reject themselves before other people even have a chance to reject them. They reject themselves. They won't even try, right? So there's not a lot of competition if you figure this out and you're going to be able to do so many things. And until you actually really try, you really have no idea um, how capable you are. Um, if you want to hear the story of how all the creative and crazy things I did to write my book and all the rejections I got, um, I have an episode called How to Turn No Into Yes. And this is actually one of the most popular, um, the most popular solo episode I've done. I think people just like to hear my rejection stories. I think it makes them feel good about themselves. So if you want to check that out, I can send you the link. Um, so many of us are not living our dreams because we're living our fears. So uh, instead of thinking about what if it doesn't work out, you know, I invite you to think about what if it does work out, right? And one good way to do that is to visualize your success. This is the V, third step of love framework. And I told you how um, my mom was so against the idea of me writing my book. And so many people thought, you know, it's never going to happen because I only went to sixth grade in Korea. And like, who do you think you are to be able to publish a book in Korea? And people need to get PhDs before you get published, right? But I didn't uh, ask for permission from other people. I just gave myself the permission. And um, I've learned how effective it is to visualize your future self having achieved your dream. Athletes do this all the time. It's called mental imagery training. So I thought, well, it's not going to cost me any money or time. So let me try that. So every night before I go to bed, I thought about my book um, being prominently displayed at some big bookstore. And of course, I haven't written yet, right? <laughs> so I don't know what it would look like, but I would just imagine that it was prominently displayed at some big bookstore and all of that came true. So this is the first time I'm holding my <laughs> book. And another visualization that I did was um, I thought about how one day I would become a speaker and share the stories of how I, you know, achieved my dream, my childhood dream, even when everybody said I couldn't do it. And I would share those stories to a group of audience like today, right? And all of that and much more happened. This is when I got invited to speak in Alaska to speak about how I achieved my childhood dream. So that was V, visualization is really, really powerful. And finally, um, the uh, last step of law framework is explore and take action. You need to give yourself the permission to, uh, you know, uh, follow your curiosities and actually take action that is aligned with your values. So um, a couple of things is like follow your curiosity, not your passion. Back when I was a unhappy lawyer, not knowing what I wanted to do next, I read so many books about, you know, how to like really figure out what you want to do. And everybody said, follow your passion. And I think that's totally the wrong advice. Uh, I think that's too stressful. Not many people actually know what their passion is, right? Like maybe very few people know that, but including me, I think majority of us actually don't know. So I think instead, follow your curiosity. Curiosity is more like a whisper. It's that little voice in your head. Hmm, that sounds interesting. Well, I might like that. So give your, so listen to that voice and actually give yourself the permission to, to follow that. And um, number two, as I said before, Give yourself the permission to do things that brings you joy and that you find to be meaningful, even if it has nothing to do with your career. And I think that was probably the most um, you know, important step that I took to help me get to where I am now. And um, don't overthink and underact. A lot of this is why so many people are stuck. They like think of all the 
scenarios of why wouldn't work, why can't go wrong, and they don't act. So they're always at the same place. So make sure to not do that. And one way to actually take action is by, you know, starting with something really small, dreaming big, but starting small. To give you an example, like when I was writing my book, that's an intimidating task, right? So I thought about what is just one action I could take today? So I created a list of all the people that I want to interview and I started reaching out to them. And of course, many of them you know, rejected me, but some people said yes. And with that, I wrote a book and I actually learned that you don't need that many yeses to change the trajectory of your life. You know, if you just try a lot, some people will say yes. And some people, um, and with that, you can write a book and, you know, you can start a project or company or whatever, whatever it is. So um, one thing that I'll mention about the rejection is that um, I've learned that the number of opportunities I got is actually correlates to the number of rejections you got. It's just statistics, you know, we all know from in the MIT community, like the more you try, the more no's you get, but some of the will be yes to. So think about small actions every day and don't be afraid of rejections and, and start, keep trying. Um, courage is more important than confidence. You know, a lot of people are like, I wish I had was confident enough to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, but usually like people have the order wrong. I learned this from Debbie Millman, who's a famous designer that I interviewed on my podcast. And she said that, you know, you don't have confidence before you start, right? If you've never um, driven a car, like, can you be confident that you can drive it? Well, no, like, but you have the courage to step into the action of trying and then over time, you have some small successes and that builds confidence. So don't confuse the order. You don't have to wait until you're confident to do something. You can still have the courage to actually take action. And I think most importantly, you have to find your tribe, right? Like your, your tribe is waiting for you and looking for you, but you have to be out there, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, another thing is like, if you're contemplating a career transition, make sure that you are, uh, uh, not only hanging out in just one community. So for example, when I was a lawyer, but wasn't sure if lawyer was the right thing for me, I, all my friends were lawyers. All my friends went to law schools and were lawyers, you know, so like, that's all I knew, right? So it's really hard to really think about a different path when everybody around you is doing the same thing. So um, get out of the community. I mean, like you can spend some time there, but don't spend all your time with one community. Where are the people who are doing the things that you want to do? Maybe it's something creative. Find those people, do something different, take action. And those people are definitely waiting for you too. And whether you find, you know, the, whether you finding, find this tribe or not, well, it's going to be very important you being able to actually achieve your dream. So that was a love framework that I've uh, described to you. And I know it was a brief overview. Hopefully, um, you know, I'll have another opportunity for you to uh, be able to talk to you about each other's stuff in more details. Um, there was another thing that I wanted to share with you, but I don't think I'll have time to do that. It's um, three steps to finding true career fulfillment. Um, it's a very, very important step. I thought of, I learned that in order for you to find your um, the sweet spot of where you're truly happy and fulfilled in your career, you need an overlap of three things. And um, you can check that out on my website, selinalee.co forward slash steps. Um, and I wanted to close our <laughs> talk today with this quote that I love. As you start to walk on the way, the way appears. You don't have to know, actually. You don't have to know all the way. You just have to start walking and then the way will appear. And this has been so true in my life. And the difference between impossible and impossible is just a one small apostrophe. <laughs> um, as I share with you, all the resources are on my website, selinalee.co forward slash MIT. And I think um, you'll get an email with this link. Um, and um, my podcast is uh, also on my website. And if you want to schedule a time to learn more about my coaching, you're welcome to reach out to me on my website as well. And here are all my contact information. So thank you so much for being here and uh, <laughs> for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Ooh, I think we're okay on time, right? Six minutes, yes. <laughs> yeah, we have some time for questions. So if folks have questions, please uh, put them in the q and I know we have a question here and I think it's a great question to start off with, but sure. clearly it's time for a couple others. But um, somebody wants to know, what's your definition of success as you define it in your career as a life coach? How do you yeah. define success as a life coach? Good question. You know, I, um, 
actually i'm going to now close the um close the screen share oh actually am i still sharing my screen or no no you're good you're good i'm good okay okay no. perfect so we're back um Yes, the definition of success. I actually asked myself that question when I was writing my book because I said, I'm going to write a book about successful people. And then as I was writing it, I didn't actually know what success meant for me. So I had to sit down and think about what does success mean for me? And how I define it is to utilize your gifts and talents to help other people. And that is how I, I define success. And I think it's a useful exercise for people to do it on their own because you know success means a lot of different things and as you uh you know create your own definition of success you'll also learn a lot of it about your values too so uh because my definition of success is like how do am i using my gifts and talents to help other people um you know that really has me guided into doing the thing that i do now so i guess i can now say i you know <laughs> i am living my definition of success so i think being really clear on that on that is really really important so thank you for the question <laughs> yeah you bet we have a couple other questions coming sure. in sure mm -hmm. um, so we have a question that asks, suppose you have multiple things you like and you yeah. actually want to pursue all of them, right? Yeah. I know, I'm sure you have multiple passions. Yeah. How did you proceed to begin to explore them? It should it be like one at a time or yeah. um, in some sense in parallel? Like what would you recommend is kind of a good methodology if you have a couple areas that you really are passionate about and want to explore? Yeah, good question. You know, I am just like you, whoever is asking the question. I've, I, had, I still have so many interests <laughs> that I want to do. And I think our society, unfortunately, kind of um, think that the, somehow, some, somehow something's wrong with us because like you're supposed to pick one thing and just do that, right? Mm -hmm. I actually learned that there's a term for describing people like us. It's called multi-potentialite. There are people who have a lot of different talents or skill sets or interests, right? And I'm definitely one of them. So I think one way that I would, um, uh, you know, one advice that I would have for you is pick one and start trying. Don't think too hard, right? Because you're like, oh, what about this one? Should I do this? Should I do that? Again, it leads to overthinking, underacting. Think of just one thing that's easiest to try, right? If you have like five things that you want to do, and um, and one of them is something that you can easily put it into action just try that. So don't even think about, you know, like, is this possible or not possible? Or am I going to, should I do this? Should I do that? You're going to spend a lot of time just wasting time thinking and thinking doesn't get you anywhere, right? Some amount of thinking, of course, is helpful, but it is through action that you're going to do. So just pick one thing. What's the easiest thing to try and just try that. And when you try that, you're actually going to learn a lot about yourself. Oh, I actually thought I would like it. I don't like it as much. Oh, I actually like this aspect of whatever the task is, even though I didn't think that I would like it. And then, and then you move on to the next thing, next thing. So I would say, don't think too much, just pick one, whatever's the easiest one to, to start and then just do it. Another thing that I would say is what is the smallest way that you can experience whatever that may be, right? So, you know, like if you're, um, uh, one other thing that I, you know, get, um, in when I was collecting the dreams for Sherry Dream campaign, a lot of people are like, I want to travel around the world, right? Um, well, maybe you can't, well, with COVID, you can't do that. Maybe you also can't quit your job and do that, right? Um, and then think about like, what is, what is that telling you? What is that, you know, activity or idea or goal? What is it telling you um, about your desires that is hidden, right? What is your hidden desire that is, you know, shown, reflected through your desire to do that, right? So maybe it's not necessarily traveling around the world, but maybe you're a little bored from this autopilot life and you want to break up your routine and do something different. Um, what is the smallest way you can experiment or try that? Um, you could, you know, be a tourist in your own city. I'm sure there are places that you haven't gone in your own community. Wherever you live is like a place people will pay money to travel and fly to, right? So, you know, go, uh, maybe it's a sense of adventure that you're missing. Maybe it's new experiences that you're creating, right? So I would kind of think about what is a the theme of the thing that you want to try, and then think about what is the smallest action I could take to actually give me what I want without any drastic changes. You don't have to retire or quit your job and things like that. So think small, just pick one thing and keep experimenting. That's great advice. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question um, that's asking, well, what's a self-coaching technique? We have about two or three more minutes just to mm -hmm. keep on time, but yeah. um, 
people who have constructed their identities around their jobs, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, what's what's like um, maybe a one or two pointers, especially if somebody's identity is completely constructed around their jobs. Yeah, it, you know, it's a hard one. And I, I, I've experienced it myself, you know, being in finance and investment banking, also corporate lawyer, right? So it is really hard to think um, uh, differently from the community that you belong to if you spend all your time in it, right? So uh, because our desires are affected by the desires of people around us. So, you know, when I was in investment banking, it was all about money and like, like, I was like, I thought that's what I should want. And, but it was not the most, I mean, money is important, but I learned that I'm not a person who's willing to sacrifice my health and quality time with friends and family for, to make the most amount of money possible. That is not my goal. And that does not make me happy. Well, I learned that the hard way, right? So if you think that, you know, you literally spend all your time around your job and that is your identity, it's really hard for you to get out. Um, I would encourage you to, to spend some time away from the community, find some other tribe to join, like people who are doing the things that you want to do, right? Maybe if you're interested in creative things, if you want to run, run a marathon, go join that group and, um, and, 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 just, and, and just start experimenting. So um, if you think that the identity of the group may not be, <laughs> you know, really serving you or their values of the group may not be your values, you have to create some physical distance, literally time. Like don't go spend all your time going to the same conferences with all the people and all your friends are lawyers, or all your friends in investment banking. It's going to be really hard for you, right? And then to do some self-check, you know, um, um, is, you know, what I, do I, am I really living my own values in terms of what I want versus what I think I should want, right? There's some exercises that I do with my coaching clients and I'm, whoever um, is, you know, asking me this question, feel free to uh, message me on my website and I'll be happy to share with you some resources. And um, there's a way to really learn to be honest with yourself. And um, another question, some self-coaching technique that could be helpful. It's a very simple thing to do is um, ask yourself this question throughout the day is what I'm thinking or doing helping me or hurting me, right? Like, is, is what I'm thinking or doing helping me or hurting me, right? Um, whatever the question is, right? It could be like, oh, I gotta like, you know, make as much money as my, as my classmates, you know? Well, is that really helping you, right? Achieve your goals? What is your, really your goal, right? Um, oh, I think I'm like such a loser because, you know, I haven't really made it in my career, whereas all my MIT friends, you know, feel like, I feel like they made it. And there could be a lot of pressure because I think um, obviously graduating from such a good school like MIT can be an amazing thing, but that also creates a lot of pressure. And I feel like um, we feel this burden to keep performing, to meet the expectations of other people. And at the end of the day, does that really bring us joy, right? So you got, you got to be able to separate what you really want versus what you think you should want because people around you want for you or because that's what everybody else wants it. So create some physical distance, spend some time really getting to know yourself. Um, uh, one exercise I have my clients do is um, paying attention to your emotions. What I talked about before, like, how did you feel today? And what did you learn about what's important to you, right? So, you know, that could be a journaling exercise you do every day. And when you do that consistently, there may be some um, par uh, themes that come up. Oh, I'm the happiest when I do spend a lot of time with people. Oh, I got to do more of that. I'm really unhappy when I'm comparing myself to other people in terms of achievements. Okay, maybe I should spend less time on social media. So you can literally translate, you can take your emotional emotion as a data point and then translate into action for increasing the things that brings you more joy and decreasing the things that makes you unhappy. So that would be some of the things that I would recommend you do. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> That advice. We had a couple other questions, um, and I, I guess encourage people to reach out to you. Yeah, the sure. That you that you put there. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again so much for sharing your wisdom with us and your journey and your experience. It's truly, uh, it's truly remarkable. And I, as well, I want to thank the MIT Alumni Association for helping us out tonight, um, and for your partnership in putting this event on. And thank you for the audience for joining us. And I hope everyone has a good night.
Thank you. And um, for those of you, if I haven't had a chance to answer your questions, feel free to reach out to me at selenelli.co. And there's a way you can contact me or my email is it's on MIT <laughs> alumni database or selenelli627 at gmail.com. So you can also email me and then I'll be happy to respond to any of the questions you may have. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Thanks everyone. Have a good night or good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.